The Apartment Gurus podcast is brought to you by Greenlight Equity Group, an apartment acquisitions and holdings firm co-founded by Carl York and Tate Seamer, host of this show. We offer you the opportunity to be an owner of cash-flowing, wealth-growing apartments without the headaches of being a landlord. These assets are recession-resistant, risk-mitigated, offer significant tax advantages, and are a great alternative to the stock market. Ready to check it out? Go to www.investwithgreenlight.com today to book a personal consultation with Carl or Tate. Again, that's investwithgreenlight.com. We look forward to meeting you. Welcome to The Apartment Gurus, where twice a week, host Tate Seymour brings you deep dive interviews with the wisest gurus in the apartment investing industry. These experts are sure to create game-changing value and inspiration designed to catapult your business to the next level. Be sure to reach out to Tate at www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. And now, here is Tate Seymour and the Apartment Gurus. Welcome, everybody, back. Another episode of the Apartment Gurus podcast is coming at you right now. And, uh, you know, again, the blessing for me of this podcast kind of continually after having done 200 plus episodes is, uh, amongst other things, just getting to, to hang out with super high level commercial real estate entrepreneurs and, uh, and just kind of, you know, collaborate and brain dump and, and share as much value with you guys as we can. And today's, uh, today's guest is, is I'm super excited about, um, Mark up to graph. We, he and I are in uh, a capital raising mastermind together, actually. So that's how we connected, but Mark is in Rochester, New York, and he's the CEO and founder of up to graph group realty, uh, up to graph management and up to graph services, as well as a company called raise capital. He's an active investor, broker, and operator, you know, as a broker and investor, he's been involved in over $200 million in real estate transactions has led peak production or peak producing real estate sales teams, uh, managed a, a leading local boutique brokerage. And he, he's a broker himself, two active broker license in the state of New York. And then with Raise Capital, he oversees due diligence and acquisitions, capital raising, investor relations, and asset management. So to say that, Mark, you have a pretty wide range of uh, skill sets and you know experienced superpowers in this space is kind of an understatement. But uh, Mark has many hobbies. Uh, check these out. Skiing, which my number one, of course. Swimming, glass blowing. That's awesome. Painting, quilting, guitar, hiking, and yoga. And he has uh, a, a wife and three kids. Uh, they travel. In fact, they just got back from uh, it sounds like an amazing trip to Italy. Uh, they hike and they camp. And uh, so, Mark, welcome to the show, man. Super excited to dig into this with you and, and sh you know, get to share you with my audience here. Hey, Tate, thank you so much for having me on here. You've had such incredible guests over your last 200 episodes. It's really an honor to be here. Yeah, no, it's it's great to have you. And, and you're going to you're going to fit right into the uh, canon of experts that at the catalog, so to speak. And, you know, with your skill set and your experience, skill set sets and kind of broad experience over the whole multifamily process from acquisitions, underwriting, down to asset management, capital raising, huge piece, investor relations. Uh, I know we're going to have a lot to talk about uh, today and a lot of value to offer. So if you would, Mark, just kind of yeah, you know, I, that intro was, it was good. I, if you could kind of fill us in, uh, to, as to, you know, kind of your story, where you, how you got to where you are in real estate, specifically in business and, uh, just kind of what makes you tick Mark, like you, yeah. know, you share a little bit about Mark up to graph with us. Sure. I'll take you guys back to the beginning. I usually skip the very beginning, but you know, I've never been good with a boss and I've had a lot of jobs over my career. You know, before I could actually get employed, you know, when I was young, I would do entrepreneurial activities and my parents would encourage me. Right. So my mom had an idea where, you know, if she dropped me off, I'd pick strawberries and then I would sell them to like the neighbors. I'd make about a buck a quart. 
And, you know, she really helped me see the value of trading my time for money versus, you know, when I was 13 or 14 and I could go work for a farmer, they paid us like a buck an hour. Uh, you know, you make nothing, but picking strawberries, I could make way more money. So, you know, she gave me that gift and, you know, my father had a transportation company. Uh, he, he was very, uh, he was just him, you know, until I was in college, he didn't hire his first employee. It mm -hmm. took him that long to like grind it out. You know, my mom stayed home and raised us. And so he had to provide for the the housing and for all the activities that we were doing and swimming and everything. Uh, but he would bring his truck home on the weekends and he would let me polish the uh, chrome, right? So we mm. get the front rims, the back rims, the stacks, wash the truck. And I could make like 60, 70 bucks, I think total. Mm. And it would, you know, when I first started, it took me like all weekend to do one truck. And, you know, I was a youngster, I was maybe like early teens or whatever. And that really just showed me that, you know, my time was worth money. And when I went into the workforce, I realized that they weren't really paying me as much as I thought my time was worth, right? Because I knew I could go out and hustle and make a little bit more money. And so my my first job at Dunkin' Donuts, you know, I was the guy that was notoriously five to 10 minutes late coming in. I was the custodian. So like I did the job very, very well. Like my parents raised me where if you're going to do something, you do it right. You take pride mm -hmm. in your work. Yeah. And the place was always spotless. They actually baked the donuts. So I was in charge of cleaning up the greasy mess, et cetera. And um, I got laid off after a couple of years and I was just really kind of pissed because I knew I did a really good job. And he was like, ah, you know, you're always late. So we're going to, we're going to lay you off. And that was kind of like my first taste. I was like, okay, don't be late for work or you're not going to have a job. Right. And um, I had a, a number of jobs since then, you know, going through college, I've always worked. I worked at Wegmans and I've had some good jobs that came through my schooling, like RIT, working in the tech industry, but I always just didn't really like having a boss. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like, they felt like I was trying to get their job or something is the only way I can really describe it. Even though I wasn't, I didn't really care. Uh, but I always kind of felt that tension between my boss and I. And uh, eventually I got laid off in the imaging field after I had already purchased a few rental properties and they had laid off so many people with my degree, you know, 2000 plus from my company. And then there were two other companies with similar imaging people that were getting laid off at the same time. My market was saturated. There was no way I was going to find work in imaging. This is after I've gone through all my college education. So I went to my wife and I'm like, look, if you want me to get a job, we're going to have to move or I'm going to have to do something else. And she didn't want to move. So, you know, we had like, half dozen to a dozen rentals. I was felt kind of stuck here in Rochester and the market for buying real estate was awesome. Like mm. abundant, tons of cash flow. And I was really getting into real estate. I, I loved it. My biggest bottleneck was I didn't have enough cash, right? Mm. I wanted to buy everything and I couldn't. Yeah. So I got my broker, I got my real estate license, eventually got my broker's license, jumped into sales. And I realized that with sales, I could make four X my W2, you know, mm -hmm. W2 with a master's degree even. So I'm like, why didn't anybody tell me this before I went to college and spent all this money to get these degrees that like, you know, scientists really don't make that much money, right? They don't even make a hundred grand. I'm in sales. I can make three to 400 grand yeah. doing the same amount of work. And I can take all that extra money and plow it back into more real estate. And that's what I did. And so early on in my career, I educated myself a lot. You know, I was on sites like Bigger Pockets and um, asking lots of questions. And as I got educated, I would try to answer questions by paying it back. And all that, all those early efforts really did pay off. You know, I, I've received so many good referrals coming in through those channels organically mm -hmm. that I didn't have to pay for. And at the end of the year, you know, I'm always looking at my sales and figuring out where I should invest my marketing money. I'd say, okay, this lead source, I, you know, I'm spending five grand a month, no joke, you know, sometimes up to 10 grand a month mm -hmm. and bigger pockets for $0 was outperforming these five to $10,000 spends on ads. Uh, and as far are, as are you generating, are you generating residential trans or like leads or commercial leads? Multi this multifamily. Point? Yeah. Commercial. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so the typical lead would come in and would be like, Hey, you know, I see, you know, about Rochester, Rochester's always ranking in the news. Like we continue to be one of the top 10 cities in the U S for cash flowing real estate. We've got really, really cheap houses and our rents is pretty decent. So people would be on bigger pockets. They would start Googling the 10 top cities for cash flow, and they would come across my name and I'd get an, in something in my inbox. And then I would just convert that into, Hey, how much capital do you have? And let me position you in the Rochester market, you know, follow my advice. 
And, you know, some of them would follow my advice and some of them wouldn't, right? Sometimes people think they know more than you do, even though you're the professional operating in that space. And, you know, the ones that listened to me, they made really good money. You know, I made a, a 22 year old couple, uh, they'd use their, before they got married, they each used an FHA loan to buy a four unit house. Uh, we, I orchestrated it off market. I knew the seller. I put them into the deal. They owned them for less than two years. And when they resold, they had, you know, combined, they made about $225,000 profit. Mm. And they use that just to, you know, get married, to buy a farm, to buy a house for their family. To, now they've got Airbnbs on the lake. Like it pretty mm. much set them up for success moving forward. They had good jobs too. But, you know, real estate is just so much more powerful and they knew it and they've continued those real estate activities throughout their career as, as they've grown in their investing journey. And so, you know, I was just hooked on real estate from buying my first rental. And mm -hmm. I knew that my market was so abundant that I could not buy every single deal. And, you know, people would come to me, they're like, I have such a good deal. Why aren't you buying it? Mm -hmm. I'm not buying it because... I don't have enough money, man. I, just, yeah, I bought the last right? good deal and yeah. I'll buy one when I have more money. But right now, if you want it, you should take it because if you don't take it, I'm calling the next guy and he's going to take it. And so, you know, I would pretty much tell everybody, look, I'm going to make three calls. It's probably going to sell on the first call. If it mm -hmm. doesn't sell, it'll sell on the second call. And maybe I'll get to the third person because I have a way of explaining to people the deal and why it works and why I get behind it. If it's something that I would buy, and they don't want to buy it, then they're not really a serious buyer in my marketplace. Mm -hmm. We're always subject to our market, right? And yeah. if you're either on the market or you're not. So I'm being, I bring the best of the market and I present that to people and then they make the decision whether they want to buy it. We run them through how to run, you know, to check the pro forma, see how much cash on cash they're going to get, et cetera. That's going to fluctuate. It's going to be based on location. It's going to be based on a lot of different factors and different investors will have different strategies. You know, I'm a location centric person. I'm going to trade off cash flow to get in a superior location mm -hmm. because I've operated for so long that I know that my back of the envelope pro forma is not equal across all asset classes, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you hone in on one asset class and you can get really good at it and you can kind of bob and weave on both sides and then explore, do you like to go towards the cash flow side? It's, it's a particular personality and it's going to take a particular skill set, right? The guys mm -hmm. that operate well in those C class marketplaces, they walk around strapped. They knock on the tenant's doors personally multiple times a week, you know, probably every day trying to chase down this rent money. Yeah. I didn't feel like that was a scalable model, right. not for bringing on other people into my organization as managed clients. So mm -hmm. I never push those units, right? Even though they'll come up like, hey, this looks like it's got great cash flow. I'm like, eh, you know, if you really want to do that, but here's why you shouldn't, you mm -hmm. know, eviction costs, deferred maintenance costs. Uh, and all these other things that turn high C turnover, I turn over high delinquency. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. The uh, class C listeners, that's a really good takeaway right here is, is to go back, listen a minute, you know, 60 seconds forward and just kind of like the, the whys of scaling up and moving up an asset class. Uh, it, things get easier as the asset gets nicer. So yeah, good point. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I think that's one of the biggest downfalls with people that the people that I've seen come into the marketplace with the most amount of capital, right? They got a million, two million bucks, and they're trying to stretch it, right? Because they want to, they want to leverage it. They want to get tons of cash flow. They come into the Rochester market. I explain to them my methodology. I show them my track record of how it works, and obviously, it has less cash flow. They just some a lot of them won't listen. They'll be like, "No, I don't want to do that. I want to go mm -hmm. to the cash flow." I'll explain to them it's not going to really work out like they think it is they always end up selling in three to five years. And mm -hmm. usually, you know, they're lucky if they can get out clean, they might take a little bit of a loss depending on, you know, how risky they got on their mm -hmm. spectrum of, you know, oh, I want to buy a $30,000 unit. I want to buy a $25,000 unit. You know, those guys lost money. You know, if they, if they spent like, you know, 50 grand a unit, they're probably going to break even, but mm -hmm. um, it's just uncanny how people can, come in, not listen to the expert and then end up, you know, tucking the tail between their legs and having oh. a horrible taste for real estate investment when they could have had a great experience. Yeah. You know, well, you're looking at the person, you know, that I worked with alongside of them that actually listened to my advice and comes out with hundreds of thousands of dollars of profit in the same amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. Another good takeaway, like find the most badass expert in in the market that can help you either help you on a, on a you know brokerage side or 
whatever that looks like. Uh, and usually it's a, usually it's a broker. Right. And, you know, go with it, run with it, like get them what yeah. they need to, and be a great, uh, be a great client to them and, and yeah, go and follow their advice. That's a good, really good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, yeah. we structured tons of JVs off of that, mm -hmm. you know, over the years, just because, you know, I can't buy everything and I would like to have a piece of stuff. So that's kind of how I tweaked my model. And that's how I eventually got into the capital raising space is just because mm -hmm. I wanted to own more stuff. So we're, so you're brokering some of these deals and partnering on them. Is it like a JV partner? Yeah. And sometimes there'll be off market deals that some of, someone in my sphere brings me. So my last JV deal, it wasn't on market. It was somebody that it would have to be a neighbor and the person, it was an estate sale. And uh, so I didn't broker it. I actually had to pay another uh, broker a fee to be part of it because mm -hmm. he, he had kind of got his fingers in, in the middle of it, but mm -hmm. I didn't care because the deal was so good. Mm -hmm. And I just jumped in with my partners who actually sourced the deal and they were relying on me to do the underwriting and to do some of the heavier lifting on some of the value add costs, uh, projections and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. we just formed a little team, uh, we laid it all out and then we all jumped in a third, a third, a third. Got it. What, what's the, a typical deal, like say that deal or, or, you know, what's kind of the typical deal, JV deal that you guys have done, how big, all that stuff. It's going to depend on who you're working with and the, their resources. Uh, Rochester's got a lot of, you know, one to four unit multi, uh, small, single family rental to four unit. And then as you get up into bigger stuff, like the, uh, four to 20, there's less. And then when you get from 20 to 60, there's, there's even less. And when mm -hmm. you get over 60, you know, the, they they rarely come for sale and okay. you know, we're very location centric too. So yeah. personally, like I'm not going to get involved in something in a bad area, especially mm -hmm. at scale, because you're just magnifying your potential for freaking disaster. Yeah. Uh, so I'm pretty cautious. I, I tend to stay in uh, nicer locations, which have density restrictions on them. You know, we, as a city in like the sixties and seventies, we increased density like crazy. So a lot of these old historic mansions that were, you know, 10,000 square feet got chopped up into like 20 unit properties. Oh wow! And yeah. um, a lot of the neighborhoods just fell apart because all, you know, they just, they turned blighted, they got drug activity and stuff. So now they're having the opposite approach and they're, they're really cranking back on density and it's hard to find stuff unless you can find like a legacy seller. So we're typically looking for portfolios. Mm -hmm. They're going to be comprised of anything, you know, from a single to a four, but then the ones that we really like are the guys that have those like eight to 20 unit properties. And they've got, you know, at least a handful of them where we can pull them into like a, anywhere from 50 to 200 unit mm -hmm. grouping. That's maybe spaced across like 10 to 15 different locations. I'm assuming you've gone full cycle on some of these. I'm a hodler. So, um, I tend to keep as much as I can. Good. So I don't, nice. I don't typically get rid of stuff, you know, and I put that out there with my partners at the beginning. And mm -hmm. I try to only work with partners that have a, a similar vision. Um, I have run into instances where, you know, they've changed their mind and they've wanted to get out of a deal. And usually we can figure out a way to structure it. So everybody's mm -hmm. happy when it exits, you know, you, you do your, uh, in your operating agreement, you can put your buy sell clause. Um, and that makes it fair for all parties if somebody wants to exit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think as long as you have a strong operating agreement, when you set up these JVs, then you know, even if somebody does change their mind, it shouldn't be the end of the world to figure mm -hmm. out how to keep the deal. If you really want to be part of it and you don't want to lose it. Yeah. So within these partnerships are, are you guys pretty much within the, you know, quote unquote J, GP or, you know, the JV structure, are you guys self-funding or are you, are you raising any uh, like retail capital for this stuff? Yeah. Typically we're going to cash finance it and then we're going to take it back to the bank and pull out a hundred percent of our capital. And then we mm. can just rinse and repeat. So we're looking for the value add uh, where we can get in for, you know, probably 50% of ARV, add another 25% in repair costs, and then pull that 25, pull that 75% back out on a hundred percent valuation. Gotcha. So what's the average purchase price on a the average portfolio that you guys pull down? Uh, it's going to range depending on who I'm working with. So, you know, mm -hmm. per unit, I would tell you that I'm, I'm typically buying in the like 80 to a hundred per unit. Okay. Um, and then it's just going to depend on how many units we're, we're locking up. You know, if you got into the hundred plus unit space, we get a little bit of a discount typically because mm -hmm. it's, 
usually needs some some value add. So maybe we're paying like fifty a unit for those. Yeah. Um, you know, and what's the, but there's what not a, a lot of them. Gotcha. So on a let's like say an eighty thousand dollar unit, um, first of all, typically are are you investing in a remodel rehab, and then what do rents look like? Yeah, I tell all my investors that are working with me that I'm I'm typically going to spend between five and ten per unit, no matter what, mm-hmm. and that's without really a quote value add. That's just mm-hmm. kind of getting it dialed into my standards, uh, so I can operate it smoothly moving forward and get a better tenant. So mm-hmm. that's typically what I spend on the value adds. You know, it could be fifty to a hundred a unit that we're putting in, depending wow. on the location. Yeah, um, you know we've we've done some heavy lifting as far as like bringing it back to studs. So it's you know reinsulating. Uh, drywall, electric plumbing, roofing, mm-hmm. windows, <laughs> flooring, mm-hmm. paint, you add it all up. It's, it's very costly. Yeah. And then what, what do rents look like, you know, either pre remodel and post remodel? Yeah. So we're probably looking at like a buck a foot mm-hmm. pre remodel and then post remodel. It's going to be location dependent, but you know, it could easily be North of $2 a foot. Okay. So you're assuming, let's say, a, for the sake of the conversation, thousand square foot unit, you're spending eighty average on that, and you're getting anywhere from, if I hear you right, you know, eighty, uh, you know, eight hundred a month to, I mean, pretty high from there. Like you're going up. You said one sixty a, a, a foot from there. Uh, two dollars a foot. So, oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I would say like on. Um, our average unit size, I'd say, is probably if you talk about like a two bed, one bath, that's probably mm-hmm. the most common unit here. They're probably like, yeah, 800 square feet, mm-hmm. as is without much cosmetic. Today, we're probably at 12. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, wow. in a more repressed neighborhood, it could be as low as like 800, but that's going to be a pretty deferred C class. Uh, you get into the B class, you should easily be at like 10 to 12. And wow. then if you get into the A class, you can push that two bedroom to like 2,500 bucks. Yeah. So that's really location centric. Yeah. So listeners, yeah, we don't talk a whole lot about evaluation on a regular basis, but right now, especially, I think if you can find properties like this that are significantly beating the 1% rule, um, it's kind of what you need to do in this market, in my opinion, uh, to make sure that you're buying right and you're not overpaying, uh, which is, you know, kind of easy to do right now, but you're crushing the one percent rule, man. Yeah, it's yeah. Rochester's an anomaly. It's it really is. Mm-hmm. What's uh, and then what's appreciation like there and rent growth? You know, on a yeah, year to year basis. If you would have asked me five years ago, I'd tell you Rochester's the flattest place you'll ever see. Like we just, you know, we we're lucky if we do two percent in like a nice area. Mm-hmm. But you know, over the last five years, maybe seven or eight years now, I'd have to look at my chart but our inventory has just fallen off a cliff, right? Mm. If you look at the graph, you know, the disparity between the inventory and the demand, you know, this mm-hmm. was our inventory, this was our demand, our inventory's dropped down below demand. And it's been like that for, you know, probably eight years. And during that time, prices have just gone up and up and up and up and up. The mm-hmm. first year, you know, we I'd tell clients, hey, be ex- expect to pay 10% over list. Mm. By year two or three, I'm like, all right, we're at like 15% over list. Hmm. By today, <laughs> I'm telling them, you know, even on a three hundred thousand dollar house, we're over twenty five percent over. You know, I've I've seen a three fifty go for four fifty, or I've seen a three hundred go for four fifty. So one fifty over a three hundred thousand dollar list. Even and in, it doesn't. I was going to yeah, say even in this higher interest rate environment. Even in this market, wow. yeah. Yeah, wow. it's still happening. We just we have no inventory. There was a small pause. Everybody kind of freaked out for about three months, and it was in the winter where there's not much activity because all the snow and you know people don't really move in the winter. And I think people are like, oh, okay, here's what we've been waiting for. Prices are going to come down. It's going to be a buyer's market. No, as soon as we hit the spring market, it was back to the races. We picked up where we left off. So we've had all these cash sales for the last eight years. Cause you know, if you don't have cash or a cash guarantee or, you know, some private person that says, I'm going to back this person with cash, you're probably not going to win, especially not on a competitive deal. It's not uncommon for us to see 50 offers on a popular listing. Wow. It's just insanity. It's yeah. insanity. Yeah. That is crazy. Well, and say, and you've obviously developed, I'm sure just tons of ways of like strategies on competing and winning those offers. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like an amazing model. Like you said, kind of an anomaly. Uh, and now that you add the growth factor in there of these last five years, like, wow, that's, that's a terrific market, but at the same time, extremely tight inventory. So you're not, they're just, the opportunities are, are, kind of limited, right? Like for, see, I say for a listener that's going, Hey, I got to go to Rochester, like, hold on just a sec. Cause you're probably going to be needling a haystack on these deals with as much competition, as little inventory as they are. If you're good at marketing, there's still a pretty good pipeline. There's not that many sophisticated investors that are good at wholesaling. You know, I would tell you in my marketplace, there's three dominant wholesalers and we got a pretty big city, right? Like our Metro is but one to 2 million or something. And then mm-hmm. or not, no, not the Metro. Sorry. The, the greater Rochester is like one to 2 million. Yeah. Um, and there's like three wholesalers uh, and they constantly have deals that are coming through. So I think there's opportunity. If you are okay, getting into wholesaling, you can find some good opportunities. And then the foreclosure market, you know, we've got anywhere from five to 10 foreclosures every single day. Mm, uh, no. That's on the steps. Those are going to typically they're either tax or their bank foreclosures. Mm-hmm. And then every year, you know, we've got a county auction, we've got a city auction where they auction off hundreds of properties. Uh, so there are opportunities if you're if you're just coming in and hiring a realtor, yeah, you're going to be in trouble. But if you're willing to do some of these different strategies, you should be fine. Yeah, and obviously connecting with you and collaborating, you know, attacking the market is obviously the the best bet for any listener that might be thinking about that or. So on that, we'll, we'll revisit this at the end, but what's kind of, what's the best way to connect with you, Mark, uh, you know, social media, how's that work? Yeah. So my cell is 585-314-9790, 585-314-9790. Just shoot me a text, you know, my emails Perfect. just, yeah. Uh, you can also look me up on LinkedIn or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You, you say, so, yeah. You, okay. So let's, um, let's, I want to kind of dive into, um, what I think you, you know, you could offer a ton of value on, um, and well, two different things that are kind of related, which would be, you know, your experience with marketing and, uh, your experience with capital raising and investor relations. Um, and so I think what would be, what I'd be interested in kind of starting and hearing from you is, you know, on the investor relations piece, like number one, wh- who's your avatar? Who are you marketing to and recruiting from? And then how are you doing it? How are you going about it? Yeah. So my my avatar right now, and I don't think I'm going to change it. It's people like me, active investors that have just been like doing it and doing it and doing it. And when you like pop your head up and you scratch your head a little bit and you're like, am I doing too much work for this return? Is there an easier way? You know? Yeah. And there is like, if the power, that's the power of syndication. And so my, my avatar is like me and just run around grinding it out as an active investor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so how do you, how do you market to that avatar? LinkedIn, what sounds like an yeah. obvious Avenue. Yeah. Bigger pockets is huge still. You know, I, I think they're the dominant, um, real estate investing platform. Yep. LinkedIn has been huge and I'm pretty much just trying to add value to people like myself that are in the trenches doing this active stuff. So all of my content tends to revolve around how to help active investors. It's a really hard uh, job, right? You know, we've got to do every, we got to find it. We got to acquire it. We got to manage it. We got to get it leased. So there's, there's tons of value that I can add to people that do that because we tend to wear a lot of hats. You know, as I started, I wore every single hat, right? I've changed the toilet. I've put a roof on, I've done drywall. I've done. So I'm just talking about all that stuff and then having funny stories about, you know, now working with subcontractors or working with employees and doing training. And Mm -hmm. there's always tips and tricks. And as technology uh, improves, you can always find ways to make things easier. Um, so I talk about that stuff. I like to talk about technology too. So, you know, mm-hmm. you'll find me talking about chat GPT and, uh, Photoshop and mid journey and all these different AIs that are coming out to streamline productivity on the marketing side, because, you know, as active investors, marketing is part of our job. Right. You know, it's right. pretty much part of everybody's job, no matter what I've yep. been successful because I am good at marketing and that's how I get a good tenant. And that's how I get a premium rent because mm-hmm. the person is attracted to me by what I'm putting out there through my marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think marketing is huge. And, you know, I like to talk about that a lot too. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, obviously listeners, if you're reading between the lines, Mark self manages, you self manage your whole, whole portfolio, don't you? Well, I've got a team, so I've got about uh, 15 to 20 people on payroll all together. Wow. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I manage the managers. Um, you know, if I was the one that was doing the property management, it would not be a good thing. I'm not yeah. that person. Yeah. I can, I'm great with good tenants, right? But if I get that tenant that just wants to be a dick, mm-hmm. I'm going to be a mirror and I'm going to be mm-hmm. the dick right back to them. Yeah. And so like, I'll, I'll be in the office, like hanging out with the guys and I'll hear a difficult call. I'd be like, give me the phone, give me the phone. They'll be like, no. No, we are not giving you the phone. We, we saw what happened last time you took the phone. You yeah. made a mess for us to clean up. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Know yourself, right? Listeners, yeah. know your superpower, know your weaknesses and outsource your, outsource your weaknesses and double down on your superpowers. Um, yeah. Yeah, property so management I wanna... is a, uh, I'll just throw this out there real yeah. quick. Property yeah. management is like, uh, you're their therapist, you're their social worker, it, yeah. you know, you just, that's what property management is. It, you have to have that function yeah. and you'll be so successful if you do. But if you're not the person that can do that, don't hire, you know, hi, find somebody that can put yeah. them on payroll or find a company that can do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Really good point. Um, so talk on the, I don't want to necessarily delve into like the vertical as far as, you know, your management goes. Um, cause just to be honest, like that's not the model that, that I use or that my, my company uses. Um, and it's not with my coaching clients and mastermind, like I don't really recommend, uh, self-management, especially as you're getting started building your portfolio. Right. It's, 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 oh, definitely it's a not. lot, yeah, yeah. it's oh a lot God. of, yeah. So yeah, let's, you know, think about like, a company, a, you know, a listener out there that is, has a firm or starting a firm that is basically finding deals, finding dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts on marketing for, for that person? Like what, you know, the hows and what's right. Yeah. So, I mean, they've got to figure out who their avatar is just like we've done mm-hmm. and they've got to produce content that that avatar wants to hear. So it's, you know, you should probably pick something from your background that you're passionate about. That's going to be the easiest avenue for you to gain traction with that audience. Mm-hmm. And then it's being, you know, be consistent with your content and with your messaging. I think that's one of the things that I've learned over the years is like, it's really easy to stray on your message because there's so many things happening in the news that you could talk about, but you got to figure out a way to bring that back to your message and you know, ultimately drive people into your funnel. That's going to lead to dollars coming in for you to, to deploy. So Mm -hmm. that's the trickiest part. Um, when it comes to marketing though, I think where a lot of people fall down is that, you know, they spend so many, so much time building these systems and pipelines and, you know, eBooks and whatever to, to drive the leads. What they're lacking is they're lacking on a system of follow-up once the lead is captured. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how many leads you get. If you can't convert the lead to a sale, it's really, you're, you're wasting your time. So Mm -hmm. I think the number one thing that people should focus on are taking the opportunities that they do have, that they do understand, okay, let's figure out one lead source, right? Uh, Maybe it's bigger pockets. Maybe it's Mm -hmm. LinkedIn, whatever it is, figure out where your, what is your lead source, Google ad, AdWords, whatever, you know, you can, you can pay money and receive leads. If you're like, Hey, I don't want to create organic stuff. I don't have the time for it. I don't have the expertise. I just don't have the patience. All right. Buy some leads. It's not, it's not rocket science. Mm. Once you have the leads focus on your conversion, right? Because leads are hard to get and they're expensive. And so if, if you're getting them, but you can't convert them, then Mm. that's what you really need to work out first. And so lead conversion, I think should be the skill set that you really pick up first. And once you have that, now you can figure out how to scale your leads, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really good at converting and I just got good at converting through uh, no mentorship. Nobody taught me. Nobody said, here's a script. This is what you should say. It's really about talking to people, resonating with them and being able to have a conversation. So Mm -hmm. um, I teach my salespeople this. It's like, if I'm calling somebody and it's a cold call, or maybe it's like quasi warm call or whatever, Mm -hmm. when I, when they answer the phone, I say, Hey, this is Mark. How are you? Or I say, Hey, this is Mark Uptograph. How are you doing? And they're like, who, you know, like that's their first question. Cause they they don't know me. I'm not saying, Hey, this is Mark Uptograph from raise capital LLC. They're going to know it's a sales call. Right. So I've, I've immediately on, on my first intro, I've 
I've shifted it, right? I've shifted that off of, it's not a sales call. And then I'm able to get into the conversation. And so, you know, I record a lot of my conversations with people and then I let my, my uh, team listen to how I, how I roll, but it's really just being personable on the phone Mm -hmm. and being able to solve problems for people. Uh, People want to talk. So even people that don't like salespeople, they still want to talk. Right. Yeah. So if you can get them on the phone and you can get them to like you, they're going to start talking to you. And then once they're talking to you, now you can start to build that relationship and then you can start to ask questions. Mm-hmm. And so I'll have like a series of questions that I'll, I'll like to sprinkle in there, but I, I want to make sure that I'm letting them talk as much as they want. I never interrupt them. And if it's, if you get like a talker, you know, you could be on the phone for a long time because they just keep going and going and going. Uh, but you know, I take notes and I, then I get them into my CRM mm-hmm. and based on that conversation, now I know what is my action plan with that lead, right? And so when you think about lead conversion to a sale, you're going to have different buckets, right? You're going to have your like zero to 30 day. You're going to have your 30 to maybe 60 day, and then maybe 60 plus day, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to drop each one of them. I'm going to classify them in my A, B, or C bucket, and I'm going to have a different routine based on that bucket. And I'll have different touch points for the A bucket because obviously they're the closest to being able to monetize and they're mm-hmm. going to have more effort. So when I time block my schedule and I come in for the week, you know, my A bucket has got the most time slots on my calendar. My B bucket might, you know, have one or two. And then as the people transverse from one bucket to another, then, you know, that's all it's all automated, right? So if mm-hmm. you get a good CRM, you can, you can pretty much automate that process and not have to think about it too much, but that's pretty much how it works. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it that's brilliant. So, and j- just to get specific for a second, are, are you using active campaign? What, do you, what CRM platform do you use? So I've used a ton of different CRMs and mm-hmm. I've had a couple of different coaches over the years. At this point, we're building out a new one. I'm using go oh. high level. Yeah. And it's, it's not quite finished yet. So I'm kind of in between CRMs, yeah. um, but you know, you could be as simple as a spreadsheet, right? If you're yeah. just getting started, you're a new entrepreneur, there's so many different services that cost money every single month. Mm-hmm. Like since I joined Raise Masters, like my monthly bill has gone up. I don't know how much it's, it's absurd. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the services are awesome and I love it. Like Calendly, you can't beat it. Uh, for, for being a professional and stuff. So, but if you're starting out, you know, you're usually capital sensitive, right? You can't just spend money like willy nilly. You got to really be focused. So just start with a spreadsheet, start with something simple Mm -hmm. and, you know, really focus on the conversion aspect of it. Right. Cause you need to be able to track your conversions. And I would say, um, you know, from there, there's a ton of different entry level CRMs that you could get yourself into that are going to be a little bit cheaper and like, really as you as you scale your business you'll know you say okay i'm actually converting i'm generating revenue now i can go into one of these more expensive platforms mhm yeah um what just just so we don't miss anything on the conversion conversation any, anything else, any other tips or uh, even like scripting points or you know anything else to kind of offer cuz it's you've you've done a really good job of creating the uh the obvious importance or you know illustrating the obvious importance to to mm-hmm. conversion any other secrets <laughs> that you have on that one yeah i mean your script is your there will be a script that you'll kind of derive as you do it and it will you know if you're a capital raiser it's going to have those capital raiser type questions mm-hmm. but i think that it's better to explore it yourself without going in with a script mm-hmm you know, you know why you're getting on the phone, you know what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. You're going to create your own natural script based on you Mm -hmm. and how you operate. So once you've done it a few times, just start to say, okay, I get them on the phone, I get talking to them. Then maybe my first question is, um, you know, if you were to invest in in real estate, you know, today, how much money do you think you would want to invest? You know, something Mm -hmm. like that. So you're going to, you're going to build those questions and you're going to kind of walk them into, you're going to, first of all, you're going to have better notes, right? So when you go back to look at that person, okay, he's got 200K, he's mm-hmm. probably going to invest it, maybe not today, but he said in like six months, he'd be ready to do it because he's selling a house, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so as you do that, you'll build your scripts. You know, mm-hmm. um, I would say that as far as lead conversion, the bi- the number one thing that people screw up on is the response rate. You know, so depending on how you're getting your lead, let's say you've got, uh, you, you wrote an ebook, right? It's got some value. Maybe it's about whatever your avatar is interested in and they click on it. You get the lead, you get the notification. You've got to make sure that when the lead comes in, that you're notified or somebody in your team is notified and you follow up within five minutes, 
You know, the, if yeah, you look wow. at the statistics on lead conversion, your drop off rate after that five minutes is is huge. Like, mm. so you're going to be, I think it's like 95% more successful if you respond within that five minute window from when your lead comes in. So mm. if you employ a CRM, they've pretty much automated it for you. So any of my leads that come in, they go, they come in and then it, it alerts me. I get a text message alert. Hey, you got this lead. And then, um, you can actually set up auto texting, which is what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. So that way, if you're busy an auto text goes out and you can write those auto, auto texts with scripting. Mm -hmm. So it can say, Hey, you know, first name, and you can sprinkle things in. So they, they know they don't think it's a robot. That's kind of one of the niche things that you got to learn how to do. Like I'll use time of day or season. Mm -hmm. There's different parameters depending on what CRM or what software you're using that you can use to make it authentic and make them think that I'm actually writing this thing in real time. Mm -hmm. And um, so once that hits and they respond to it, that's where you are. You're like, I got this person, they're engaged. And when they're engaged, that's kind of when your five minute window starts. Mm -hmm. And so my thought process is always to get them on the phone. I want to start that or even a zoom or whatever, but usually it's, I start with a phone call mm -hmm. and I want to start building that relationship, take those notes, figure out if it's somebody that is going to work if, if we're a good fit for each other, right? There's certain people that I don't want to work with. So I'm kind of vetting clients, just like clients are vetting me. It's kind of like a two-way street. Yep. And so that's my initial kind of consult call. And then I'm usually going to book a further meeting. Like I'll keep my initial consult. I try to definitely want to stay under a half hour. I'm usually trying to keep it at like 15, 20 minutes. And that's where I'm going to add some value. They're going to get off the phone and be like, dang, that guy's a freaking expert. He knows everything. And then I'm going to follow up with my systems, right? So my systems will probably be like, Hey, you know, it was really great meeting you. Why don't we actually, you know, jump on a zoom call, uh, make sure you bring any of your partners. You got a spouse, something like that. Let's all get together. You know, let's have a conversation and we'll be able to dive deeper into the stuff that we talked about on the phone. In the meantime, I'm going to shoot you these resources and take a look at those. That way, when we get on the zoom call, you will be a little bit more on the same level. You can ask some questions based on what I send you. And they're like, yeah, that sounds great. Right. So I'm trying to limit that to 15 minutes, send them the stuff immediately, and then book that zoom call later. So, you know, you can get the actual face to face, which I think is important. Yeah. And, um, at, after that point, like it, you should, they should be like yours for life. That, that should be your client. They should love you. And then you can almost sit back a little bit and not worry that they're going to wander off into somebody else's uh, territory uh, because they should be coming to you as long as you've enacted the systems that you do, right? You, you've you got the deal flow going to them automatically. So they're on your list of deals mm -hmm. and you've got content that's coming to them. When they're ready to make a move, they're going to come back to you and you're not really going to have to be like, okay, I got to call this guy every week or, or whatever, you know, you do want to have touch points if you feel like somebody has gone too long. So let's say I get them initially onboarded. I do the zoom call. If I don't hear anything from them, I don't get a text. I don't get an email. I don't get anything within a month. I'll probably follow up again with another phone call, right? Cause you really got to keep that personal connection going. And uh, that's how you, and that's what drives the buckets, right? Oh, that communication is like, okay, they're either in A, B, or C, and that's going to dictate, okay, am I calling them in a week or am I calling them in a month? Mm -hmm. Right. What do you say? Just curious, what, what kind of resources are you sending after that first 15 minute call? Um, so I send a lot of stuff depending on, you know, what, because I, I still deal with a lot of different lead flow. So for mm -hmm. like a capital raising uh, resource, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to send them some, some ebook stuff that I've done. I'll send them some, you know, tutorials, uh, depending on how much they know about investing. Right. So I could get as nitty gritty as like, here, this is a pro forma. This is how we do the pro forma. Here's a more advanced pro forma. Mm -hmm. Um, talk about like, you know, the 1% rule, the 2% rule, gross rent multiplier, um, if, they, if they're interested in Rochester specifically, I have a ton of resources on Rochester. So I've just, over the last 15 years, I've made different heat maps and um, all kinds of stuff. So it depends on who they are, but typically that's what it's going to look like. It's going to be some educational pieces on um, calculating cash flow, basically. So ebooks, PDFs, mm -hmm. some videos, I'm guessing, maybe yeah, spreadsheet, spreadsheets, yeah. models, yeah. yeah, all that stuff. Nice. Yeah. Um, it, it, do you recommend a specific click magnet for somebody that's kind of putting their first thing together? It's a good question. I mean, whatever it is, 
just make sure it like actually adds value, right? So yeah. that's the tough part. I think some people outsource that and they end up being a little bit cheesy. And so it's hard. So usually the stuff that converts the best for me is stuff that I've actually worked on myself and I've spent mm-hmm. quite a bit of time on. Um, it's going to be my take on stuff, right? So I'm not mm-hmm. just saying, I'm not just copying a pro forma from a textbook and saying, this is a pro forma. Mm-hmm. I'm going to explain a pro forma from my perspective and I'm going to explain how I made those assumptions, when I changed mm-hmm. those assumptions, and I'm going to give them real life examples. So I'm going to say, here are some of the deals that we've done recently with investors, and this is what the performance looked like. So they can know what to expect in the marketplace today. Um, and then I can show them some historics if they really want to see that. But usually I don't because you know the historics look better than today, and I don't want to show them something that I can't I can't deliver on. Um, so I try to give them like our most recent two or three deals. Um, I, I always give them the heat maps awesome. too. If, if they're yeah. coming into Rochester, you know, cause that way they can get a lay of the land. So mm-hmm. I think um, the geography and, you know, I split up the geography with an overlay. So I take the map of my CMA and I, or MSA, yep. or whatever it is, the city. MSA, the city yeah. Map. yeah. Yeah, MSA. Yeah. And I, um, I carve it up and I overlay colors on it. And then I can talk about what the average gross rent multiplier is is mm-hmm. in those markets. And then I can explain to them that like our strategy is going to be to find an area that's got a lower gross rent multiplier, but it is surrounded by higher gross rent multipliers due to demographic shifts and maybe employment shifts and mm-hmm. revitalization efforts and you know city initiatives and stuff like that. So I can get a lot of talking points on that. And then I can send resources on the actual things that I'm talking about. Like we're doing a bid in our downtown uh, so it's a business improvement district where it's pretty much going to tax property. It's like a special assessment kind of for mm-hmm. people within that district. And then that money goes back for programming in that area, right? So I can use that as part of my talking piece if I'm talking about an asset that's positioned in that area, right? So I've got a 54 unit that I'm raising for now, and it's right there in the bid district. So that's going to be some of the resources that I send to that person if that's the conversation that I'm having. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like, like you said, if if you're if you know if you're on these people, ideally within five minutes, and then you're getting on a fifteen minute call, and you're then you're providing that kind of expertise and like uh, you know assets and value add to them, like why would they go anywhere else? There, there's nobody is going to out compete you on that, right? Right. Yeah, yeah that's powerful. Dude, we're out of time. I can't believe this. Um, <laughs> this has been just rich, man. And, uh, you know, tons of takeaways here already. I think what we probably need to do is have you back on and say six, eight months and, uh, and kind of look at some of the other aspects of your business. And, but I, I think I really did want to get into this marketing and investor relations piece with you. And I think, we, we did, we got in some really good stuff with that. So I'm, like I said, really appreciative. Um, so, uh, w- real quick, just your contact again, what's your cell phone number? It sounds like that's a yep. preferred, preferred way. Of yeah, it's, it. it's the easiest 585-314-9790, 585-314-9790. Shoot yep. me a text, you know, my phone number is all over the internet. So I just block everything that comes through that's bullshit and, you know, just text me, tell me who you are. I'll add you to my contacts and I'll put notes in for you and uh, we can be best friends. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Awesome. So yeah, listeners, Mark up graph has been our guest and uh, reach out to him like, you know, for just make contact with, you know, when guests offer their cell phone, their email address, like, that's gold guys. And so, uh, and of course I'm always here to, to, rally with and brain dump with, and, you know, just work on your business with and that sort of thing. So, um, so Mark, thanks a ton. Great episode. Love this and, uh, appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. That was fun. Yeah, you bet. And then listeners, thank you again. We love you guys and just appreciate this opportunity to add value to you and your business and inspire you and kind of help you move the needle. So hopefully this was kind of next level for, for you guys. And, uh, and I recommend going back and listening again, like some, an episode that's got this much richness and density and kind of takeaway, like always great to listen a second time. And we love the ratings and reviews. If you leave us one, uh, helps us out a lot. So, uh, and you know, our commitment is to do this 
as high level as we can for you. And we're, we're bringing you two episodes a week, um, indefinitely moving forward. So, um, so thanks everybody. And, uh, until we meet again, have a great rest of your day and take care. This has been the apartment gurus with Tate Seymour. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform to contact Tate. Go to www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. He loves to hear from you and thanks you for being a valued listener. Just a reminder that you are the guru. See you on the next episode of The Apartment Gurus.